Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the March Angular live stream for the Mountain View and San Francisco Angular Meetup groups. Uh, my name is Kevin Cowanan. I'm joined by Alex Rickabaugh. We are both uh, on the Angular team at Google. And uh, today we have something very exciting for you. Uh, Alex is here and he's going to be talking to you all about signals. So it's something really awesome that's come up recently. Um, did some introduction on GitHub and some cool stuff around that. So this is your opportunity to learn more about it. And then at the end of everything, uh, to ask some questions and uh, yeah. So uh, just some quick housekeeping stuff. So um, if you're not part of the meetup groups already uh, and you're local to the Bay Area or globally, uh, feel free to join. This is being recorded. This will be available uh, once we're all done um, at the same link. So if you can't make it for the uh, whole thing, definitely uh, it'll be there for you. Um, and I think that's kind of it. I, I don't have anything else interesting to say, so I think I will hand it over to Alex and he will take it away. Uh, remember to ask your questions in the chat. And if you want, you can keep your questions until the end. We'll pop the questions up on the stream and then uh, I'll read them out and then Alex will be able to answer them and uh, everything will be groovy. Knock on wood. All right. All you, Alex. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. So it's actually been a while since I've been at the Angular uh, Mountain View San Francisco meetups. Um, probably not since we you know, had one in person last. Um, but Hopefully the, soon once again. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, looking forward to it. Um, so for people who don't know me, uh, my name is Alex Rickabaugh. I have been on the Angular team about eight years now. Um, I joined kind, kind of right around the Angular 2.0 days. Um, and I've worked on a bunch of stuff on Angular, like HTTP client, um, the compiler. And I'm currently the tech lead for Angular Framework. So that's kind of the core render, compiler, forms, router, et cetera. Um, and lately, I've been working alongside my teammates on a project called Angular Signals, um, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. Uh, so. I'm actually going to do this a little bit differently than most of the talks I've done in the past. Um, I typically have like a slide deck and some kind of um, you know story arc that I want to share to go with it. Um, but I've been watching a lot of Ryan Carniato's live streams, and I'm going to try to do something a little bit more spontaneous and interactive. Um, so I'm going to let's go ahead and share my um, document here. I'm going to start with a blank screen, basically. Um, this is HackMD. If you've not seen this tool, I highly recommend it. It is so much fun to work in. Um, it's essentially like a markdown editor that allows you to kind of edit in real time with uh, you know, collaborative editing with others um, and share the documents and things like that. So we have the split screen view, um, the kind of rendered view, and the, the coding view. But it's very it's a very well featured editor. So that's going to be my whiteboard for today. Um, and I'm going to kind of tell the story of Angular Signals, going back to the very beginning. And I intend for this to be kind of more interactive than most talks that I give. Um, so I have the comments up on the screen. Um, there's a little bit of a delay, but if you say something, I'll try to keep an eye out. Um, maybe if Kevin is also watching, he can let me know if people have kind of interesting questions along the way. Um, but yeah, feel free to chime in and, and kind of let me know if, if this is working, if you have other questions, et cetera. Sounds good. I can definitely pop in if there are questions. Awesome. Um, so like I said, we're going to start at the beginning um, and talk a little bit about what Angular actually is as a technology and how it came to be that way. So in the dark days of the internet, um, the dark ages before kind of all of the, the mo nice modern web frameworks, um, we had this thing called jQuery. And jQuery was solving a few problems in UI development. Um, back then, the web was kind of a wild west. There were you know, three or four different browsers. You had Firefox, you had Netscape going back you know, quite a ways. 
um, you know, Internet Explorer. Everyone loves to remember Internet Explorer. Um, but many of the things that jQuery was doing were trying to bring some sanity to this divided ecosystem. You know, browser vendors in the early days couldn't even agree on the right way to make an HTTP request. You had kind of the ActiveX API on the IE side. You had the, you know, XHR API on the Netscape side. And so jQuery was bringing some sanity to this world by just giving you one API through which you could do um, pretty much anything you wanted. And it looks kind of like this, right? Everyone remembers kind of writing like, oh, you know, query for my button. And then like when it's clicked, I write some function to do something. We didn't have arrow functions back then. Um, and so maybe in my UI, I wanted to display the user's current name or something like that. So I had my input element, or let's, let's just say like um, span, your name is, you know, Alex. And let's give this an ID, ID is name, right? Um, and then if I click the button, let's say I want to change the name to Pavel. Um, I would again use jQuery to query for this, uh, this time for the name ID. And then I don't actually remember the old jQuery APIs, but it was something like this, right? Um, you would imperatively tell the browser, hey, go and update the UI because I want to change something. And if this name was shown in three or four places on the page, you had to kind of copy paste this update three or four times to update it everywhere that it mattered. And this worked rather well for small applications, but if you started building bigger things, you quickly noticed that you were spending a lot of time keeping track of where all of this data was being shown, which things needed to update anytime something happened in the application. When you get more data from the server, you have to go out and poke the new values kind of into three or four places, um, especially if there was a lot of intermediate calculation or really dynamic parts of the page. Uh, it was very easy to forget things. And we had UIs that could get into very inconsistent states as a result of all this kind of manual updating. And so somewhere along the way, we had a revelation. And we decided that the right way to write UIs was to do model-driven UI. And what this meant was we would structure our applications as a data model. So we would have some variable. Back then, I guess it was var name, not let name. Um, JavaScript really has come a long way. Um, and whenever the button click happened, however, we subscribe to that still. So, you know, button click, um, yeah, that's a function. We would say name equals, um, you know, Pavel. And what we wanted was for some kind of magic to happen, right? We wanted the UI to be expressed not as a bunch of places that we have to go and update in this quick function, but as some concept of a, deri a derivation of our model. So your name is, and then you know, I'm using Angular syntax here, but get the general idea. We would somehow say the UI is a projection of our model um, that's always consistent with what data we've put in the model. And so now we update the name in one place and we expect some part of the system to handle this for us to project this value out everywhere that it's needed. This is model-driven UI, um, and this is what AngularJS implemented. So let's kind of build AngularJS a little bit. Um, I'm going to take a lot of liberty here. This is not code that is going to run anytime soon in any browser, right? Uh, we're just going to look at kind of conceptually what AngularJS actually was. Um, and so we had in AngularJS, you know, everyone remembers dollar scope and everything, but I'm going to call it the model. Um, and the name here is Alex. And then I would express some template. Um, so we have our HTML templates, components, controllers, whatever, right? Somehow we had, and your name is and let's just call it model.name, right? We're referencing this model. 
And that's great. And so we have our button and we have our ng click or whatever it was. I didn't do a whole lot of Angular JS, so forgive me for getting this wrong. Um, and here we would have the reaction and we would say, okay, model.name equals um, Pavel, let's say. This is kind of a very simple model-driven UI. And we expected the tool that we were using, the framework, to understand that when we change this model.name thing, we would go and update all of the places in the UI where that name was displayed. Um, this is this was the dream, right? And this is what Angular JS actually made into reality, alongside Knockout and a couple of other um, technologies of the time. But the way Angular JS did this is what we're interested in, uh, and that's through this process of change detection. Angular JS had this promise, basically, you put your state in the model and let me deal with the UI. And in particular, all you had to do was put your state in the model. You didn't have to tell AngularJS necessarily when you were going to be changing it. Um, and that's because AngularJS kind of understood all of the places where this state might be updated. So to make this magic, to actually make the browser work the way we want to, um, make it show the model and update the model as it changes, we need a couple of ingredients. We need to know when things happen in the browser, which is when the model might change. And we need to be able to um, reevaluate the UI in terms of the change model or the potentially change model. And so AngularJS did this because it kind of was in control of how you interacted with the browser. You would never register your own click listeners on buttons. You would tell AngularJS that you wanted to do it. You would never make your own HTTP requests using the native browser API. You went through $HTTP or $resource. Um, when you waited for promises, right, you were using $Q. This is back before promises were really standard. And what this meant was AngularJS knew this. It knew when something interesting might happen in the browser because it knew when you were allowed to change the model in the first place. Um, and then to do the second part, it had this process that we called uh, change detection. And what this meant was AngularJS kind of saw your application as a function. And this function would accept the model as an input and it would like return basically the UI, right? Or like UI updates, right? What do we need to change? And here we would keep some state. So let's say we had this model.name binding in our application. We would have like the previous name, which would start off as empty. And we would do some comparison here and say, OK, if the model.name is not the previous name, then we need to go and update the text binding, right? So like, you know, do our jQuery thing of getting the span um, and set it to the current model name and update the previous value. And that was basically it. This was the operation of change detection. And AngularJS, um, as, as people know who worked with it, right, had this habit of running change detection multiple times. And that's because in the middle of this process, it was sometimes possible in your controllers or components or whatever, like, oh, maybe I, you know, if model.name is Pavel, 
I want to like set, you know, model dot show last name to true. And so Angular JS would wait many iterations to see if this model would actually stabilize. Um, and I think we did like 10 and then threw an exception or something and said, basically, we give up. Your application is too dynamic. Um, but the key parts of this idea, right, the key ingredients in this magic were knowing when things would happen in the browser. And then this concept of I'm going to go essentially synchronize the model to the UI. I'm going to look at all the places where the model is used in the UI. I'm going to see if those places need to be updated. And I'm going to go ahead and update if so. I'm just pausing to check for any questions, comments, people are following along. Um, that was AngularJS. Um, then about 2014, uh, Angular started to enter the picture. Um, I forget when the exact kind of public announcement was, but I think it was around then. But Angular inherited this idea of model-driven UI. It inherited this idea of running change detection. And it attempted to solve some of the kind of performance problems and overhead of AngularJS. Um, and there were a few issues here. So issues that we saw with AngularJS, right? Um, many digest cycles were bad. That just took a lot of time in the browser because change detection, is, while is a relatively cheap operation to do, it was very easy to get into situations where you had to do it many times over. Um, another challenge that we saw with AngularJS was browsers were getting new APIs. Um, and remember, the only way this system worked, the only way we were able to know when to run this magical change detection reconciliation process was to know when things happened in the browser. And that means that we had to know, we had to be kind of in charge of everything you were doing in your application that might result in you running code. That's both you know, reacting to events in the application, that's responding to HTTP responses when they come back, um, you know, timers, everything had to be passed through an AngularJS specific wrapper, right? So we needed wrappers for the world. $Q, $HTTP, $Resource, et cetera, right? $Timeout, I think, was another one. Um, $Watch to respond to model changes. And that was getting both expensive to maintain, and also people wanted to call browser native APIs directly. Sometimes you wanted to use libraries in your application that were you know, using the browser native APIs directly. Um, and so Angular tried to fix this. And it did a couple of things along the way. Um, one is that it said there will be only one digest cycle. That was a super critical decision for us. Um, I remember that, you know, I was just joining the team back then. There was a lot of discussion about like, you know, should we be continuing to do this check, you know, change detect until the thing becomes clean? Or should we try to enforce some kind of higher standard of we're going to have a what we call unidirectional data flow, right? Data, this idea that data flows from your parent components down to your child components, um, but not backwards in the other direction, which was one of the reasons why AngularJS needed multiple cycles. Um, and the second thing it tried to fix was um, we want people to be able to use the native browser APIs. There were many other changes kind of in between the two frameworks, but these are the ones I wanted to focus on today. So the first problem is more of an architectural question for applications, right? How do you write applications that are able to synchronize their model to the UI in one pass? And secondly, um, how on earth can we write this framework that has this magical property that we want, right? This magical property that like you just declare where your state is, 
you assign to the state, and this is enough, right, for the framework to synchronize this new name with the UI. Right? How do we have this property when someone is writing, you know, set timeout for say five seconds and then updating the name back to Alex? Right? Framework needs to know that this has actually happened. And at the time, we were looking um, at the Dart programming language, as well as TypeScript, as well as developing our own programming language that was kind of a weird branch of history. Um, but Dart had something really interesting that it was doing. And it was called this concept of a zone. Um, and so we looked at how zones work and decided, yeah, this is actually a way to achieve this magical property of knowing when the set timeout runs so that we can react to it, right? Basically here, we want to call our like synchronize model to the UI. We want to call our change detection operation after any chance that your application has had to do its updates. We don't know, right? We don't know if you did this assignment inside the set timeout, if it changed anything. Um, but as long as we know that something might have happened, we can kind of speculatively run through the application and check, did you update anything? Um, and so this is what ZoneJS does. This is the problem that ZoneJS solves. It gives us an alert whenever anything might have happened in the browser. And it does that in based in, in kind of the most straightforward way possible, which is a funny thing to say if you've ever looked at the Zone.js code, because it's highly abstract in order to be as compact as it is. Uh, but what Zone.js essentially does is say, OK, let's take set timeout as an example. Um, so I'm going to say the real set timeout is window.setTimeout, the function. And it turns out in browsers, you can just overwrite these things if you want. So we can replace set timeout with our own implementation. Great. Um, and so you have the function that we're going to call, and you have like the time in milliseconds, right? Um, and we're going to call real set timeout in our implementation here. So return real set timeout. Um, but we're going to overwrite this function that gets passed in. And we'll run the function you told us to. Right? So this is like what the user wanted their timeout to do. Um, and then we're going to say, hey, Angular, right? Um, run change detection, please. Or rather, like something happened in the browser. That's all ZoneJS does in a nutshell. It monkey patches every API in the browser that can take one of these asynchronous callbacks, promise then, XML HTTP requests, add event listeners, set timeout, set interval, you know, like mutation observer, all of these things, and adds a little bit at the end of those operations to say, hey, do what you told it to do. But whenever that's done, whenever you're finished maybe updating the model, right? Does function here update the model? Maybe. Let the framework know about it so that we can come along after the fact. And essentially, this is run change detection. And this operation of change detection in Angular is kind of recursive in a way. So it starts at the root component in your application and says, OK, like check the template for the root component, um, which will sync the you know, component to the UI. 
And then like for child component of, you know, component children, like run change detection on them. I'm being really like high level here. Um, but change detection is recursive. It goes from component to component to component. Um, and so this check template operation is really doing two different things. And the distinction is going to become quite important. Um, so one thing is we are you know, synchronizing the model to the DOM of this component. And we're also synchronizing inputs of children on the component. Because Angular allows you to express your model-driven UI not only as this text node or this you know, input class name depends on the value in the model. It also allows you to pass values to your children. So we have this kind of nested hierarchy of component models. So this is basically Angular today. And it's a fairly nice model to program against. Um, unlike in a lot of other frameworks, you don't ever have to tell Angular, hey, I'm going to update this thing. Um, because Zone.js kind of knows what keeps an eye on what's going on in the background and tells Angular when it needs to go run change detection to figure this out. Um, so I will pause here and just check and see if people have interesting questions. Yeah, just a reminder, um, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, we'll, we'll answer them as we go. Uh, so far, I haven't seen any, Alex. Cool. OK. If yeah. I pop up, I will, I will interrupt you rudely and get it addressed. That works for me. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so, so all of this machinery right, is trying to enforce this magic of not needing to communicate to the framework where or what is going to change um, or when that's going to happen. And it works. Um, it's a very nice model to code against. But as people have built bigger and bigger applications with it, um, we've seen a few cracks appear in this, um, in this magic. So let's talk about some interesting cases. Um, how many people have seen, you know, expression changed after it has been checked, right? Everyone's favorite error in Angular. What does this error actually mean, right? Why does expression change after checked happen in an Angular application? Um, and the, the, you know, funny off the cuff answer that I like to give is like, oh, it means you forgot a set timeout somewhere, right? Um, you put set timeout and expression change after check goes away. But why is that the case, right? Why do we need this thing? Well, it comes down to the fact that we had this decision, there will only be one digest cycle. We expect data to flow in the application in a certain way. In particular, we expect data to flow from parent components to child components. So we can kind of rephrase this as data flows from parent components to child components, but not backwards. In other words, the flow of data in your application matches the flow or the, the UI hierarchy, right? Um, and this is a super critical assumption that Angular makes about applications. And we will see that this assumption is not always as true as we would like it to be. It's always possible to kind of push data into this model, um, but it's not actually true for uh, many use cases in the framework. We do uh, actually have a, a quick question. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe not so quick. Uh, Steve Whitman asks, was there another approach other than using Zone.js that was also seriously considered when you creating Angular 2? Um, not to my knowledge. And that's mostly because my knowledge doesn't extend back that far. Um, I joined the team kind of around the time Angular 2 was becoming public. 
And so much of the, that part of the backbone had already been designed. Um, so I don't think so, though, because I think the the goal back then was to actually like Angular was not supposed to be as big of a change from Angular JS as it was. Um, the goal was to kind of keep the same architecture of the framework. OK, perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, so expression change after it has been checked happens when we violate Angular's assumption about how data will flow during change detection. This piece is critical. There are two phases of this UI update. So the way this is supposed to work, right, is I change or like the user does something which causes an event listener to fire, which means that I update um, the application model. And you can change any part of the model you want that any component depends on because you're kind of acting in the, I would call this like the action phase of um, the event happening. And then we have the reaction phase, the phase that zone.js triggers where Angular tries to sync the model with child component models. That means like you've updated the input of a component. And so we're going to take that input and pass it through the template and maybe send it to child components, et cetera, but also kind of UI to DOM or like model to DOM synchronization. Um, and it's, this operation of flowing data from kind of parent to child component models that causes that, that runs the risk of causing expression change after checked. It is completely fine to synchronize parent to child. It is not okay to synchronize child to parent. Um, and let's look at a case of like where that might happen, right? Um, so what's a good kind of example here? Um, so let's let's write some real Angular code, right? Um, class like parent. I'll just call it parent because that's easier. Um, and component class child. And so let's say we have um, our name here is a string, and have uh, like show name in bold, right? It's a Boolean field. And we'll start this as false. Um, and so we'll template will be like, you know, name display class dot should be bold is show name in bold. Um, call it child actually. And the name to show will be our name. So we're passing name as an input down, and we have this should be bold class that we're trying to set on it in CSS um, determined by this Boolean flag. Um, and the child is the thing that's actually going to show the name. So we'll have an input here for the name, and we'll have a template just like, you know, display this name. Um, exactly like this, right? Um, so, well, we could say, actually, if an ng on init here, right, if we get a name, the first name that we're going to show is Alex, right, then I really want my name to be in bold. And I know in Angular that I can do things like um, inject the parent component. And I'm just going to tell the parent component, show name in bold equals true. Zoom out here a little bit to try to get more of this on the screen. Um, so name here as an input is part of my model as a component as the child. But it's coming from the parent, right? So it is not set until this reaction phase of change detection. So change detection starts 
it takes whatever name was set here, let's make it Alex, and it evaluates this parent template. And it does two things. It sets the name input of the child to Alex, and it sets the CSS class should be bold to false, right? Because it's initialized to false. And then change detection descends into the child component. And inside the child component, we were able to update this DOM, right? We've got our input value from the parent. But also, we run this ng on init reaction. And the ng on init reaction says, oh, the name is Alex. I'll just go ahead and like poke this value back up into my parent component that, hey, the name should be shown in bold. And now we have a problem, right? Because there is no zone JS here saying, hey, Angular, right? Zone.js isn't watching. It won't tell Angular to go run change detection because we're already in the middle of change detection. We're already processing the child component. We're already in the reaction phase of like, you know, the, the event happened, the parent was created. Um, and change detection scheduled and, and tried to go and update this thing. Um, so this is how you can end up like violating this unidirectional data flow. And it doesn't have to be so blatant, right? Um, maybe instead of parent, I have the like bold service, right? Just some random service that I'm injecting. And I tell the bold service should be bold is true. And maybe my parent component here it was like, oh, yeah, OK, bold service. And I'm going to say, hey, bold service, like, should I be bold? Now, these two components aren't communicating directly with each other. But one of them is changing a model that is watched by the other. And so this is how you end up with this expression change after checked going in the, the backwards direction. Um, and it turned out that this is a really common pattern for forms. Because remember, the concept of unidirectional data flow here means that the flow of data has to match the UI hierarchy, right? And we were passing this like should be bold value backwards up the UI hierarchy. And it turns out that this is what form, form validation looks like. So a form here, form is a hierarchical thing, right? We have kind of the whole form has a value. And then you have a control in the form that also has a value. Um, so let's, let's look at like, I have my form and it's going to have a name control or, or like first name control and last name control. And this is going to be an input. And this is going to be an input. Let's actually, you know. Uh, HTML here, um, form, input, input. So first name, last name. Name is first. We have a simple form with two names here. And let's say they're both required. Well, is this form valid, right? Maybe I want to show an error. Maybe I want to show, like, you must, um, you know, enter first and last name here, only if name is valid or you know form is valid. And let's make this like form is ng form and do it properly valid. This is kind of a problem because if I set this value here, the first name, and I change the first name, I'm changing this input. But now the validity status of this input might be changing. I might be setting the name to empty, in which case it's you know not a valid name. I've said it's required here, or like might say like min length is three, something like that. Um, and that's changing the validity status of this control, 
which should affect the validity status of this whole form. And suddenly the parent component is depending on something that can only be known after the child is checked, right? Now, angular forms don't actually break in this case because we have this, um, because when we set values and update validity status, we actually do this promise.resolve operation, which is a fancier set timeout. Um, and what that does is cause a new round of change detection to start. It moves us out of the reaction phase of the UI update and back into the action phase where we can change whatever we want in the model because change detection is going to go along and flush everything to the UI. So there are use cases for which you actually want data to flow differently than your UI hierarchy. You want data to not follow the necessarily the direction of parent components to child components. Forms is a pretty good example of this. So we've accepted some compromises, some trade-offs for this magical model of I just changed the model and the UI automatically updates in the background. And I don't have to think about how I structure my state or how I tell Angular that I'm changing it. Um, this is kind of one of those, those big compromises. Um, another one is that zone.js is really panicky. It overreacts to things a lot um, because it has no idea when you, when, when some event happens in the browser, whether that event is, you know, a marketing script that you put on the page, checking if like the cursor has moved or whether you just completely changed half of the UI model and we have to go and tear down the whole page and rebuild it again. Um, so zone.js is prone to overreacting to events in the browser because it has no information about what actually happens when someone clicks on a button or when an HTTP request comes back. It has to assume that you might have changed any component in the app. And this normally is OK. The, the cost of synchronizing the UI to the, to the model um, is actually fairly no, low. So one change detection is cheap, right? They're not that expensive. Um, every performance app like problem that I've ever profiled an Angular application um, and looked at, like, looked at like the page being slow, the problem has been change detection happening too much. Um, you know, you load analytics on the page and accidentally somehow initialize it inside the zone, and then it's setting a bunch of timers, and that's causing you know your app to change detect twenty times a second. Um, that kind of thing tends to cause performance problems. The actual top to bottom synchronization pass itself is fairly cheap, but still, we see it's really easy to fall into this trap of zone.js listening to too much going on um, and causing your application to run change detection far too often. And browsers are actually getting far more complicated. Um, you know, AngularJS had promises and, you know, dollar HTTP and timeout service and watching models. Now there's like intersection observers and mutation observers and native async awaits and, um, you know, object observe and all of these different APIs that might give you a callback for when something happens. And zone.js is getting more expensive because it doesn't know which things your application is going to use. It's going to go and monkey patch all of them because it might actually, your application might use that API. So this is the value proposition for signals. Um, so let's talk about what signals are. Signals are and will be for Angular an alternative reactivity model to um, the one we have with, them, with zones. So they're based on the idea that if you tell Angular 
where your state is and when it changes, then we can tailor that UI update, the synchronization of model to UI um, with only the components that need to be checked, only the UI that needs to update and not have to scan the entire application. Um, and this trade-off is worth it, essentially. Um, so let's look at kind of how signals will work in that case. So if I say we have a component here um, and we have a template, Let's do our name component from before, right? Um, what's a good way to show this? Um, let's actually not. Let's build forms. <laughs> um, so let's have our form control. Um, so we'll call it our class input. Um, input component, which is going to be a fancy input, right? Um, so, and let's do, yeah, let's do this. So here, So our input component needs to do a couple of things. Um, we need to be able to receive values from the outside, right? Um, we need our model. So let's let's give ourselves an input name, and we'll make this a constant just for the sake of um, of the example here. But we also need to know the value of this input. And what I'm going to do here is, is something like um, something like a template-driven form, but we're just going to inject like our application model, um, so our form model, let's say. And our form model here is going to have, let's say, first name. And we're actually going to make this like a writable signal of string. So signals are variables, right? They are values that we can change. Um, they are values that can change, right? But that can notify interested consumers that they've changed. So writable first here is a writable signal, which means it's a signal that we can directly just change. So let's let's look at that as an API. So first is a signal, and it has a value, which is Alex. And so I can just ask this thing its value. Um, I can console log it. And because it is a signal and not just a plain JavaScript variable, I call it in order to ask its value. I'm calling it as a getter function. Um, this is like a you know get value operation. And this is interesting because it means the signal actually knows that it's being used. And if I just do this in console log, I'll just get the value and nothing else interesting happens. But if I do this in the template somewhere, right? If I say first here, then I'll get the name the first name displayed. But this component also knows now, because it knows that this first function was called inside the template, it knows that it depends on this value. And that means Alexander that Brown asks yeah. like a behavior. I'm not I'm not exactly sure what the context of the question is, but but they ask yeah. like a behavior. Um, so in in yeah, you're absolutely right, Alexander. Um, in academia, like in the academic world, um, when we talk about self-adjusting computations and there there are kind of papers published on this and incremental computation systems. Um, the term for this is behavior. Um, I don't actually know where that comes from. I've always found it a little bit confusing. Um, but yeah. So we'll, we'll jump back a little bit to signals here. Um, 
in a simpler form before we go build forms, because I think that'll be easier. So first name here is first, right? Um, first name component. And we'll make first a signal of Alex. And if I go and change this signal somewhere, right? If I say like first dot set to Pavel, so because it is a writable signal, I'll show the type just, you know, it's inferred, but um, because this is a signal that I can change, right? I can just like any variable in the model before, I can update this thing's value. Um, and I have to go through the set API to do it because you can't just, you know, replace the value of the signal um, without it. But what I get for that is now this component that I've written, the first name component, knows exactly that it needs to be checked. That its, its UI needs to be synchronized with its model. And it knows when it doesn't need to be checked. Right? It knows that if nothing has, if this first name hasn't changed since the last time it was read, then we can leave this text node on the page indefinitely. Um, you know, we don't have to revisit this component. And so signals give us fine-grained information. Right? Fine-grained is like really um, specific information about um, which components have changed when the application model updates. And we have that information because we actually understand now which parts of the model each component depend on. So we know this because um, we know which parts of the model the application depends on. And we also know when those parts of the model are changed. We don't have to monkey patch set timeout anymore in this application because you are not just updating the model as a plain object. You're setting a value into the signal. You are telling the signal, hey, I've changed. And that's enough for us to know, oh, we need to schedule some updates to happen because we know that there are components that depend on the value of the signal. Um, so we can also make a last name, right? I'll just say R here. Um, so we can set and change these things. Um, so let's make this component depend on both, right? Um, maybe I wanted to show the full name here. Maybe I wanted to show first and last with a space in the middle, and I can do that in my template, sure. Um, actually, yeah. Um, but if I'm using this in a bunch of places or if like it's more complicated and maybe there's a middle initial and other things, I don't want to repeat this logic all over the place. Um, you can actually take signals and derive new signals from them. And so I can express that full name here is a computation of first name plus a space plus the last name. And because of the magic of signals, this full name value, I can console log it as well. It, I, it's just any other value in the application. It's just like I in my ng on changes or something, I said, oh, the full name is the, you know, the first plus the last. But this thing also understands when it's changed because it knows that it depends on the first and the last signals that we created. And so if in my component here, I say full name, and then I still do this operation of like, okay, let's set the first name to Pavel. This component still knows that it needs to update. It can still schedule this refresh of itself because it knows that it depends on full name and full name knows that it depends on first, which changed. We have a question so, around list yeah. arrays and signals. Do you want to answer that now or? Would you rather answer later? We can talk about arrays. That's fine, right? Um, so let's put some names in arrays. Uh, so we have names, right? Signal so Alex, Pavel. We'll do the people on the Angular team. Uh, Kevin here. Um, 
Awesome. Um, let's show names in the template. So uh, UL, li. I think we need backticks for the syntax highlighting to be happy. Um, ng4, but name of names, right? Names is a signal, so we read it. That way our component knows that it depends on this thing um, because this read operation can actually like tell Angular, hey, the component that you're currently rendering cares about me. Um, and we'll display the name here. So name from the array. And then UL here. Um, so how do we update this thing? Well, we have a couple of options. Um, we have an update method for signals, which allows you to basically take the current value, right, and give a new value from it. So we can do our kind of like immutable data spread operation. OK, we want to add, um, let's say, Dylan to the mix here. Um, we can update the array that way. This creates a new array with the old array spread in and a new person inside of it. It gets more annoying to mutate values this way, right? If we have to like find the value that we're mutating in here, maybe we want to make like someone's name uppercase or something like that. Um, but we have another operation as well, mutate. And mutate just says, take the current value and do something to it, right? So current value dot push. Andrew S. We have three Andrews on the Angular team, so we have to distinguish between them quite often, um, including initials. We have an Andrew JS and an Andrew TS, which I've always thought was funny. Um, and notice that we haven't changed the identity of the array here. It's the exact same array object as before. But we've told the signal system, hey, we're making a change to this value. Right, We're mutating names, and we plan on doing something to this value inside this mutation function. And that is enough to tell this component that it needs to update, even though the identity of this thing has remained the exact same. Think that makes sense to everyone. Yeah, writable signal looks like a behavior subject. Interesting. Um, yeah, let's do uh, let's do a fun um, counter example, right? Um, so counter is signal of zero, and we're gonna make a counter component. So component split is just gonna display the current counter for component. Um, And counter dot set to three, right? We expect that this component will show zero, and then when we counter set it, we'll show three. Um, but what if we do this? What if we say set it to three and then set it to five? Um, in RxJS land, right? If counter were a behavior subject, what you would actually yeah. Um, what you would see is you would call, you know, counter.next3, counter.next5, and whoever was subscribed to it would see the values 3 and 5. Signals don't actually work that way. Um, setting a signal does not actually do anything. It just notifies dependencies that that signal might have changed. And I really do mean might have changed, because if I set it to 0 and then 0 again, um, clearly it hasn't actually changed, right? Um, but you may only learn that later when you go and read the value. And so in this case, if we set 3 and then 5, um, we're only going to rerun this component's template, right? Refresh it with the UI once, because signals kind of are, are naturally lazy and batched. Um, so let's let's do something we shouldn't do. Um, let's say double counter, right? Is a computed that's going to 
say like you know value and I'm going to return twice the value. So we'll read the double counter. Um, so we set three, set five, and then we call double counter from the template. And let's say we do what we're not supposed to and say we're going to have a side effect in here. This is like you know doing something in an RxJS map operator. Um, the value is value. Saying counter set three tells double counter, hey, you've changed. That tells the template, hey, you've changed. But it doesn't actually rerun the template. It doesn't read the value of double counter. And our computation never updates. So we get no log messages here. Right? We set it to five, also no log messages. Then sometime later, right, Angular re like uh, synchronizes the counter component. It calls double counter. Our computation runs. And we get a log message. The value is 5. So whereas RxJS and behavior subject are more designed to propagate events, right? the value that you pass to behavior subject will make it to subscribers whether it goes through a map or you know switch map or something like that. Um, but the value you set on a signal kind of just sits there until someone actually cares to read the signal. And so may, you may have values that you set that you never actually observe. Um, signals are used to represent just values at a point in at, at over continuous time, whereas RxJS is mostly used to represent events that are discrete points, like you know, the HTTP request came back, that kind of thing. So signals will just drop values on the floor if no one is interested. Um, you know, there's no guarantee that these computations are ever going to run. So let's get back to talking about forms. Um, I think we're an hour in. Yeah, just about. Uh, yeah, there are, so some, I'll, there are a couple other questions, but I, I don't want to yeah. drag things out too long. So, If I use mutate to change one value in the array, will Angular perform an update for that value only, um, or instead for the whole array? It depends how you structure it. If you put each of your values in a signal, you can tell Angular that only one of them changed. If you don't need that level of granularity and you want to put you know your entire array in one signal, that's fine too. Um, so the interesting thing I wanted, the, the point I wanted to make about forms, and I don't think I'm going to write the whole thing out because that would take too long, um, is what signals do is decouple the direction of data flow from the direction or from the UI hierarchy. And this point takes some time to understand. It took some time for me to understand, even when I was kind of like working through the, the design on this with, with the team. Um, but what this actually means is um, when we write that form case, again, I'll just copy paste it maybe. Um, I'm still getting used to kind of presenting in this style. Um, let's look at what this might look like with signals, right? Um, so here we have value is first name is now a signal. Um, Form.valid, now a signal, right? Um, so somewhere I do first name dot set empty string. I overwrite whatever the user has there. I want to clear the first name. When this happens, so this is like, you know, my, my, um, Let's call it like, like my click listener, right? This is like the user clicks the reset button. On reset, clicked. Um, I set the first name signal to empty string. This is that action phase, right, that we talked about before. This is before Angular has started synchronizing the UI with the model, we're updating the model based on that results or the, 
you know, the whatever we want to happen in the application, whatever the user interaction was. Um, so we've set first name to empty string. This is going to make the form invalid. But now our form validity is not something that can only be calculated whenever we're going through this process of change detection. We don't have to wait for this expression to evaluate because this is a signal. The input control can get this input as a computed property, right? So we can express in the form system, hey, valid is a computed of like all of the controls, right? So first, you know, first name is not empty string and last name is not empty string. Um, and so by the time we get to the point where Angular schedules change detection because signals changed, we know when that happens, we can know and schedule change detection. So, you know, sometime later, Angular runs change detection. By this point, the valid status is already available, right? Whenever we run this ngif, this form valid already understands that the name was set to empty string. We can run this calculation and figure out the form is no longer valid. We've decoupled the flow of data in the application from the UI hierarchy. And so no more expression change right after it has been checked. There are many other parts to the story. Um, you know, there are many other advantages and disadvantages and trade-offs of signals versus the zone JS way of doing things. Um, but I wanted to make this point. I wanted to kind of go through this exercise of understanding really what it means for data to be coupled to the UI hierarchy um, and the trade-offs of doing that, right? You get this kind of, we can update the model and just magically know um, that our UI is going to be synchronized. But we run into these problems where sometimes we want to flow data backwards in the system, and that becomes harder to do. Um, and I wanted to show that this new signals thing that we're working on, um, one of the main benefits is it actually does decouple the way your data flows in your application from the UI hierarchy. Uh, and so it kind of addresses some of these more tricky use cases to deal with Angular. One of the reasons some you know, big forms and complicated composed forms are really awkward to work with sometimes is because you're kind of fighting against the direction of data flow. Um, and that is a problem that signals can make much better. So I'll stop there with the kind of live section and start taking some questions. Awesome. There was one question uh, about clean coding principles with respect to signals in an Angular project. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I actually think this doesn't change all that much with signals. Um, you still need to think about the architecture of your data in your application. You still need to think about where state is stored, how that state is updated. Signals actually make it a bit easier for you to see that operation and to be disciplined about where you're going to mutate things. Um, because one thing, you know, we were looking at, at the example of pushing data backwards, right? This like bold service um, that we could just update the state from inside of any random component, right? This is just not a good architecture to have. Um, and it, it if you wrap this thing in a signal, then you have to be kind of explicit about giving other parts of the system, other components, the ability to change that value. Um, that's not something that comes for free. You actually have to expose that functionality to the user um, because it's not just a plain property that you're exposing. It's like an, uh, a wrapped value um, that is readable by default, but not writable. So I think signals will actually make it a little bit easier. And applications that already have very clean data architectures should port over um, with less 
kind of you know overhead. Awesome. And then there was a question We're, earlier uh, about when to use RxJS and when to use Signals. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so this is is covered in depth um, by our upcoming RFC. Um, at least like the the kind of challenges of RxJS and and particularly around rendering with RxJS and templates. Um, and so my personal take on it, and people have different opinions, you know, RxJS is a, is a famously um, powerful, but also hard to learn library. Um, and that power is really essential to some operations, um, but it can be overkill in others. And it can cause problems in others because like, one of the challenges, for example, is RxJS is always kind of can be asynchronous. And sometimes that's not what you want. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to be able to ask, like, what is the current value? And so my, my take on it is use RxJS when things get so asynchronous that you need its capabilities of switch map and, and merge map and um, concat map and, and the kind of asynchronous flow orchestration and use signals to update your UI. So RxJS handles the async part of your application when that gets complicated enough to need it, and signals handle the synchronous delivery of values into your components. Um, someone, Alexander Brown, asks, can I replace my input getter setter behavior subject setups with signals? Yes, inputs will be signals. Um, and so they can tell you when they change, you can the, the really cool thing is if you have a signal input in a component, um, so component, we'll just do like basic template here, say name, like yeah, um, input name is a signal of string. Um, so Angular knows that this template depends on the value of this input. If you don't do this here, right, if I just hard code the input to say like Alex, um, then even if someone is setting this input, even if someone is binding name and changing it over and over and over again, Angular will know that your template does not actually depend on the value of this input. And you don't need to be change detected whenever it changes. Um, so we get really good information about what components need to update. And we can really optimize that. Does a single project support signals and zone JS at the same time? Yes. Um, in V16, you will be able to use signals similarly to async pipe to like mark on push components for check. Um, and in the future, we will have kind of this concept of like a signal component and a zone component, and they can work interoperably in the same application. Will signals make Angular pipes useless? Um, is another interesting question. Somewhat, actually. Um, many of the cases for pipes are also things you could do with computed properties. And computed properties are more flexible. Um, we get feature requests all the time for, can I have pipes in my component code? Right? Can we use pipes outside of templates? Or can I make, um, you know, can I have an easier way of making pipes in my components? Um, can I have an app pipe method or something like that? Computed properties address kind of all of those requests. Um, if you make something in a computed property, you can use it in your template. You can use it in your component code. And it has the same kind of memoization internally of only updating when it needs to and not recomputing every time. Will signals make pipes useless? Um, signals as inputs, any special syntax? Yes, stay tuned for the RFC. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not giving away secrets here. <laughs> um, and just meta question for everyone. Um, this was my first time doing one of these kind of more stream of consciousness talks. Um, was this interesting? Did I go too fast? Was it easy to follow, hard to follow? Well, we already had a request for the uh, HackMD file. So I definitely <laughs> I don't know if, you, if you want to share that, but you know, potentially yeah. you can share that after the fact. 
Yeah, uh, everyone, I think. And then I'll... I don't know what the best way to share the link is. I can give it to you, I Kevin. I can put it in a tweet afterwards. Um, yeah. Sure thing. Yeah, so so as Alex said, there is still an RFC coming. Um, so I think a lot of other questions will be answered there. Um, and uh, I want to I want to protect Alex's time a little bit because it's already six fifteen in the evening here. So you know, we can't keep qu answering questions all night, unfortunately, as much as we'd like to. But uh, yeah, there'll be there'll be other opportunities to ask questions. You can also always tweet at us, um, and you know. When the RFC is out, definitely would love to hear hear your feedback there. Um, Any last second questions here you want to answer, Alex? Yeah, there was another one that I think is repeated from earlier. Um, yeah. Are there any performance metrics using signals over ZoneJS? Not yet. Um, <laughs> this is very much still a work in progress. Um, we have kind of a prototype implementation of the basics. Um, that is, is the basis for what we're doing in 16. My expectation would be that for a well-written application in ZoneJS and a well-written application with signals, it will not be enough of a difference that it would really matter performance-wise. What's more important is it is much harder to shoot yourself in the foot with signals because it's very easy to get ZoneJS to be very aggressive about how often it runs change detection. Um, and it's very easy to um, need to run multiple change detections because you're trying to pass data against the hierarchy. One, one example we've seen in an application in Google, um, they had a component that was trying to do one of these, like I need to set a validity status or something on my parent. And like many Angular developers around the world, they knew that this was would cause an expression change after checked if they didn't wrap it in something. And so they put set timeout. And that works just fine. Set timeout basically takes you out of this reaction phase and back into the action phase, mm -hmm. causes a new round of change detection, which is exactly what you want if you have one of these components on the page. But they had 50 instances of this component in a data table. And that was 50 set timeouts, which causes 50 separate change detections. There are ways to protect yourself against this, but it kind of illustrates what I mean by like, you can get ZoneJS to get really overactive sometimes. Um, so I expect for kind of average applications that aren't paying too much attention to this stuff, um, signals will be kind of measurably more performant, but maybe not in a way that affects the user experience so much. Awesome. Well, I guess we can uh, we can about wrap things up there. Um, just as a reminder, this will be available uh, at the same uh, link uh, on YouTube after we finish streaming. So if you missed anything or if you just want to go over this again, um, also, I think I'll be sharing the, uh, the HackMD on Twitter, so twitter.com slash Angular. Um, you can find it there. And then probably, probably tomorrow. Uh, it's a little late today, but uh, yeah. And then uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time. This was, this was really awesome. It sounds like people really enjoyed the format. So you know maybe we'll see more of this in the future. And as Alex mentioned, there's an RFC coming, so look forward to that. Uh, hopefully that will answer a lot more questions and also uh, prom probably prompt more questions. So, yeah, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we will be back next month with another uh, meetup and more exciting stuff. So, yeah, thank you, Alex, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. Everybody. Have a great day, everyone.